My name is Dallin Bundy, and uh, I'm going to read like six minutes of my fiction story, which is pretty much a love letter to uh, the author, Stephen Milhauser. So, um, this is like the first third of my story. Uh, it's called The City Proper. <clears throat> Four days after the Augustine tenement fire emptied the St. Jones Northern Barrio, Elias Bernays painted the Laramie Tunnel into a 300-foot walk through aquarium. He began blocking simple swimming shapes onto the concrete bend in the walls, splashing aquas, greens, and purples with fluid abandon, like he piped the sea itself through the loose hoses of his sleeves. He affixed a new array of lights, custom fit with rotating cones lined with crumpled aluminum foil that spun to flicker soft, luminous drops across the painted tunnel, shimmering Bernays' brushstroke creatures with life and movement. A dragonfish skulked behind a blood-purple coral twist, whipping up the ocean floor with the delicate wake of its passing. Barrel eyes clumped together meters from the sun-glimmered surface, where light penetrated their cellophane brain caps, so those who walked the tunnel could look on the high bend of Laramie's roof and see the thoughts of fishes spilling from the dark outline of a dozen little knifing bodies. Below the barrel eyes, the water stretched back into a blue darkness so infinite and thrilling that many who passed through the tunnel shied away from its walls, walking, as it were, an invisible tightrope stretching down there in the center. And so it was that Elias Bernays had worked a wonder through the underground passage. In that deep water tunnel, the man accumulated an impossible collection of fish, crustacean, and cephalopod life. He broke the boundaries of their ecosystems and spliced predator with predator, prey with prey, until, like the compression of polar energies, this new ocean community condensed with a spark surging into a hopeless arrangement of fish that seemed to comment on the natural order, as though Bernays' aquarium expressed a truth larger than truth, that the special impossibility of his painting portended a new, yet undiscovered reality. Dumbo octopi shared space with giant isopods, lizardfish with anglerfish, medusa eels with goblin sharks. A pink cloud of flower hat jellies lifted to the surface where crystal eyes of sunlight swelled their bellies with brilliance. Children would clap a parent's hand upon entering Laramie. They'd grow up the tunnel walls and press their faces to its glass to better see the hulking Bozark crabs trundle underfoot. Emerging from the tunnel to the street, the children would release their breath in massive gusts, amazed to have held their air for so long and so deep underwater. The Laramie Tunnel connected St. Jones's east and northern boroughs, where the burned-out Augustine tenement still shifted the weight of its charcoal over failing beams. In the hustle predating the fire, commuters often favored quicker and safer routes than the tunnel. They walked open paths in view of God and vigilant officials. Then Augustine came down to cough smoke and fire through the chimney pipe of Laramie Tunnel, and necessity reinforced habit as the passage baked into a smoldering cave. Nearly none deduced a reason to return. Inside that black and withered tomb, there was nothing left to see. And so Bernays encountered no particular challenge completing his painting. He dressed in orange coveralls and cordoned off the tunnel with police tape. He wheelbarrowed gallons of paint into the tunnel and brushed color over the black char and soot that clung to Laramie in lapping shadows. With rollers, he covered the old imprints of fire. With clip-on eyeglass magnifiers, he stippled away the smell of charcoal until the people of St. Jones returned to the Laramie Tunnel, pulled there as if under a spell. They walked the tunnel to spike their schedules, to tease their destinations. They strolled Laramie the way some might stroll a park, and when they emerged from one side or the other, the realization of open sky and solid ground often spun and dizzied their inner compasses. The Augustine fire had come to stay. Though the flames did pass, they did so like thieves retreating to the shadows. Though out of sight, they still fumed under walkways and traded stories behind alleys. Heat buzzed under every St. Jonesian step. The sidewalks seemed to hum with it as though at any moment the correct combination of concrete and shoe leather would flare up the streets with roaring, resurrected fire. Perhaps unaware of why, the people of St. Jones walked Bernays' aquarium tunnel with a certain dogmatic adherence, an elemental hope its water would cool their feet. Straight from the mouth of Laramie's north exit stood Iglesia, a city block in the northern borough all but erased by the fire. St. Jonesians emerged from their aquarium tunnel to look up at Iglesia's black brick buildings and say, as if programmed, oh yes, I remember. And then they would return home, often with slumped shoulders. They did this for days. They'd exit the tunnel, frown at Iglesia, and return to their lives, smelling the sea in their clothes and splashing water from their shoes. 
There remained in them a memory of St. Jones, of the Augustine tenement, a candlelick of flame that the Laramie Tunnel, with all its water, had failed to douse. Elias Bernays breathed in the night air as if to draw out the atomized remnants of St. Jones and its people, and the way they used to dream so plentifully, they'd stuff the excess in their pockets and trade their visions on hand with a neighbor. He breathed and breathed to mine the floating tatters of those visions from the precipitated air. Against the street lamps, he saw them spin and dip. He saw them vibrate in the space beneath stars, diffusing starlight into dripping streaks of glowing paint. He thought to write his name in that running light, but soon repented of it. He just continued to breathe and breathe, and from there came the dreams, dozens, hundreds, surging from the bricks where they lay preserved like detritus from a thousand years of rain. They cobbled and amassed before the artists, where he began to plane them out, each one, cutting interlocking grooves into their edges, reverently puzzling the pieces into a single collective tapestry. Then he looked for a canvas on which to paint it. Thank you. Wow.